The Deep Zone by Tony Caldwell. Copyright 2022. It moved again. Whatever monstrosity it was that lurked in the countless fathoms beneath me in this hellish place. The displacement of water and the disorienting torrent which accompanied it sent me once more spinning in the black, and my panicked breath hissed in the chasm of the diving helmet like a ruptured steam pipe. My arms and legs ached with fatigue from the constant attempt to tread water in this endless void, knowing full well that I was sinking, plummeting to the unseen bottoms as if the very blood in my veins were made of unbreakable stone. Oxygen levels low. Karen, the automated life support system in my suit, was my only friend here. She never had a name until now, when the slow crawl of my madness had seen fit to give her one. The only voice in the darkness. The only sound in the deathly silence of this world where nothing else dare break it. It was the sort of silence one would only hear in abandoned homesteads in disrepair, or worm-ridden nightmares of untold horror. Not even the shifting of the very liquid surrounding me gave the slightest hint of a burble or waft, even when disturbed by the stirrings of that thing from below. There was no telling how deep this ocean went. All I knew was that it could not be shallow. No sun or moonlight above or beneath. If I even knew what those words meant anymore, as I'd been buffeted and mixed by the tides every which way since my arrival here what now felt like weeks ago. I was a crewman of the salvaging vessel the Saria Cortez, named for one of the voluptuous barmaids on the islands northeast of Würzburg, who to the captain was a good luck charm, and, to the rest of us aboard, a fair-weather triste if you were willing to rent out a shady motel room by the hour. We'd made quite a name for ourselves in our short time as a crew, being the only men brave, or I guess foolish, enough to part the murky, treacherous waters of the faint sea, upon which not even seasoned sailors dared set their bearing. But, so long as that dreaded island of Zero stayed well out of sight, we were content to make our daily bread plunging for artifacts in the depths surrounding it. We had departed the Saria Cortez on this last mission, the one that led to my current predicament, with a diving crew consisting of myself, the young and delightfully naive Adam Crawford, and my longtime mate Matt Hennigan, to a depth of 2.3 miles, what mariners refer to as the abyssal plain. It was there that the object of our client's interest lay frozen in the sediment, half buried, leaving only the rounded top standing still in the water like an archway. When I say it was massive, I mean it. Although the seabed had little in the way of comparable terrain, Watching Adam dwarfed by the thing when he floated past was enough to make me shiver at its imposing size, resting here like a pennant for what was likely eons judging from the algae and seaweed festooning it. It was a strange thing to be salvaging, this giant stone wheel lacking any obvious significant features to me or to my partners. But a job was a job, and ours was to find a way to get this thing to the surface. I swayed in the water, staring at it as we waited for the winch to reach us from the Cortez. All vital signs nominal. Karen was much less of a nag then, always bringing me good news with a mother's warm tone. It was moments after her report that the jagged hook came sliding down to us, trailed by its squid-like straps from above. Adam, always the eager one, raced to retrieve it, being pulled away by Matt, who gave as firm a head shake as he could, and pointed in my direction. Had I known what would happen, I might have given the kid a go. But as it was, I kicked my fins and made for the straps. I knew it was huge, but I really didn't feel it until I was right in front of the wheel, only feet away from the triangular arch that its half-sunken ring had formed in the sand. My first thought was of whether or not the Cortez could even handle a task of this magnitude, but the captain knew what he was doing, I supposed. With a firm grasp on the strap in my hand, I examined the artifact from top to visible bottom, trying, at first, to locate any breaks that may give purchase to the winch's pull. Though it was broken here and there, and terribly weathered, no spot seemed coarse or crooked enough to bother trying. The only way we were hauling this bad boy topside was if I secured the straps through that arch. From the triangular center of that stone circle came a rippling, but not of the sort you would expect from the mere ebbing of deep water drifts. As I approached it, I felt a strange sensation in my bones as if they had become as malleable as the tides surrounding me. Matt's voice crackled over my radio for but a moment, 
urging me to back away from it, that something wasn't right, but I did not listen. I could scarcely move now. Some unknown force, like the alabaster grasp of a dying man's hand, had me in its dark hold. The ripple, present seconds before, now transformed to a wave, and from within the ring came a horrid noise. A terrifying grumble, mingling with tornadic energy, spewed forth, and the wave at once took the form of a swirling, black mass, undulating with dreamlike rhythm and cadence. It beckoned me. I felt the strap of the winch slip from my fingers, and heard the barely relevant babble of Matt's voice over the radio, begging me to stop drifting forward, but to no avail. The membranous, inky mass continued to stretch outward, its every gyration increasing its size and pull. For some unmeasured amount of time, I was slowly drawn in, devoid of fear or hesitation. Indeed, devoid of any emotion, as my unblinking, withered eyes struggled to perceive that which now seems almost indescribable. Moments, or what I assumed was moments later, it engulfed me. Oxygen levels low. God damn it, Karen, I know. Snapping back to the present, I sighed and gave a soft apology to her, remembering she was my singular companion here in this lonesome, eldritch void. There was nothing else. No topography, fish, plant life, nothing. Nothing but me, the pitch black water, and Karen's dire warnings of impending doom. That was all. Or so I thought. There was something else here. Something impossibly massive, stealing in the dark of the emptiness under me, coursing through the depths like a reaper in a vacant crypt. I sensed its movements and the crushing weight of its likely murderous intent. It felt positively primal, old, ancient. If those labels could truly be given to something so timeless as to live in this amorphous empty space, absent of anything resembling the known passage of second or hour or minute, as I came to discover. A creature that may impart one of two things, callous indifference or painful death. My only hope was for that of the former, but it seemed like the sort of naive wishful thinking one would expect from green around the gills Adam, not me. And even if it were so, even if whatever this unseen, possibly malevolent force from time immemorial was just a dumb animal, totally oblivious to my presence, what then? I had no need to remind myself of what fate still yet held in store for me if that were the case. Karen had no problem refreshing my memory with her usual charm. So, to die by suffocation or potential ingestion? It was not a decision any man should have to make, and, fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, one which suddenly seemed to be made for me, when the horrible quiet that held dominion over the court of my senses for what seemed an eternity was at once dethroned by a voice I dare not describe. It was a sound so accursed, so utterly abhorrent to my ears that there is nothing in the known world which exists to draw comparable parallel. This cavernous, unbearably loud roar enveloped all. Not just the untold fathoms below, not just the miles of blackness above, but my skull, skin, and mind. Under its pressure, a crack must have traveled its instant, crooked path across the glass of my diving helmet as I felt the trickle of that sludgy water drip inside, lapping at my neck in a shallow pool and slowly filling to my chin. I prayed it would drown me quickly, as the vacuum of ruptured current assailed me once more, tossing me about like a spider caught in a drain, and the thing in the deep traversed that uncaring vacancy of demonic brine. I fumbled in its wakes, turning left, then right, knowing full well that whatever it was, I would never lay eyes upon it before it took me. Its presence, though unseen, was palpable as I sensed its enormous force pass by me, above me, behind me, everywhere, as if the whole black sea had become sentient. A fear I'd not known since my childhood came rushing on in a flood of tears and screeches, when I was sure this monster was right in front of me, grinning with gnarled, blood-stained teeth, thousands of mouths full of them protruding from its serpentine face on the end of an impossibly long, grotesque body, which stretched all the way down to the center of this cursed sea, and its multitude of black, pitted eyes full of ravenous hunger, ancient as the stars themselves, cast upon my squirming body with blind, primordial rage. 
The ebony water now began to fill my mouth, and I coughed violently. Through all of this, my body would not allow me to drown itself. I offered up a prayer in vain to any god that would forgive me, any devil that would have me. Its final, guttural roar echoed through the whole of existence, and I screamed as I heard more and more cracks appearing on my helmet until finally, the glass gave way, and the water rushed in. Oxygen levels low. The only thing I remember was my own gasping and moaning as I clawed my way across the deck of the Saria Cortez, slipping and fumbling like a wet dog. After throwing up a bucket of black, nauseating fluid, I flipped over onto my back and caught my breath, warmed by the rays of a sun I had given up all hope of ever seeing again. Matt, who had resuscitated me, filled me in on the details later. That was after, of course, I had gotten to my feet and seen that they had hauled up that unspeakable stone, which now lay on its massive side tied to the barge toad in our wake. I backed away in terror, babbling nonsense words and asking where Karen was, to which my fellow crewmen's faces showed awful confusion. They'd lifted the ring to the surface only an hour after I'd approached the archway. Impossible, I thought. I'd been there for what felt like days, after all. Weeks, even. Matt told me that I'd come pouring out of its center, my helmet caved in and my suit covered in that viscous black liquid. Some of which, he said, our client wanted samples of. I tried to confide in him, my oldest friend, what I'd experienced on my impromptu journey, but the incredulity in his eyes was all too real and damning. I was sure he didn't believe me, or maybe he was told to say what he did say. See dementia, Brian. That's all it was. You got too much water in you and had a delirium dream. Kept arguing with him after that, pointing out that even Adam had seen me vanish into thin air, as I'd heard him babbling about it in the halls outside the sick bay as I recovered. But to this, Matt simply shrugged. Who's Adam? Never heard of him. You sure you're alright? I quit the salvaging business after that, retiring to my apartment in Lee, where I spent most of my time poring over request forms for a meeting with the Saria Cortez's mystery client in K-City but no response ever came. I went as far as to take a trip to the shipping yard, despite my desire to never go near the water ever again, demanding to speak with the captain, but only to be turned away and told to file even more monotonous paperwork. My sleep has been plagued by nightmares ever since that incident. Not even the sleeping pills prescribed by my doctor helped to keep them at bay, nor the booze, the consumption of which has become less of a vice and more of a lifestyle of late. My wife, Tabitha, took the boys and left, not even clearing her things out. And here I am, alone, forced to stare at her nightgown hanging from the hook of our closet, a cold reminder of what that fateful trip did to me. Though my eyes were not still on even that terrestrial image, as they wandered unfailingly to the dingy, shaded corners of my bedroom, dredging up haunted images in my mind of the undulating, cyclonic mass which tore from the archway of that forlorn stone like a festering wound. I feel the incessant need to go to the corner store tomorrow and purchase a rope, a sturdy one that can loop neatly over the ceiling fan here in my tiny room. I was meant to die there. I did die there. Or at least, the man formerly known as Brian Fordham did. All that remains is a drunken, sleep-deprived husk of a man tormented by memories of a place that may or may not have existed. How can one man live with such ghastly knowledge that somewhere between the folds of our reality might swell such a limitless void where this nameless creature splits its waters beyond time and space? And every night when I close my eyes, I return, back to the slithering black sea of that deep zone, hunted by something that no living thing ought to be hunted by, stalking in the dark staring with soulless eyes, moving through the depths as heavenly bodies move through the stars, yet unbothered by the laws of our world, or perhaps even our universe. Watching. Waiting. Longing to consume the prey that escaped. And every night, it finishes the job.